Chennai. They are developing into the communication, but they are facing a lot of challenge about the security, stability. So now today, into the introductory session of this, we are going to discuss about the issue, and especially for this, I am inviting from Australia, Amb Cyber Ambassador Mr. Tobias Fikin for a keynote address on this subject, please. Well, on. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. It's great to see you this morning, and it's a real pleasure to, hear, to be here at the IGF um, and have the chance to open up this really important stream um, that you're all taking part in today. Um, and, and I must say thank you so much to the multi-stakeholder advisory group who decided to invite me. Real privilege to be chosen and, and be allowed to open up this track. Um, and and a, a track of work that I spend an enormous amount of time on, um, I guess, unfortunately. Um, in some ways, I, the Australian government views cybersecurity as a fantastic enabler for all the great things that we want to achieve in the online environment, whether they be development goals, whether they be economic growth. Um, we, we believe that sound cybersecurity practice and security practice in general will enhance all of those objectives. Um, but we're also mindful that there are some big changes that are going on in the world um, which are important to talk about um, and important to engage with such a, a wide group as we have here um, today. So I'm the Ambassador for Cyber Affairs in Australia, um, and it's a real privilege I was given this position as the inaugural Ambassador for Cyber Affairs, and we see our cyber engagement in the broad, so we place it at the heart of the economy, um, but try and address the whole range of security risks, whether they be cyber crime, um, state on state, international security activity, and try and address those in order that we don't lose out on all of the benefits of the online environment um, that we know and love. Um, and I've, it's been summarized that, that my role really is as simple as trying to ensure that we keep all the benefits that we enjoy in the online environment whilst negating the risks uh, that we face as well. And what's Australia looking for? We're looking for an online environment that's open, free, secure, very simple words to say, but very hard words to actually deliver upon. But we try and do that through something called an international cyber engagement strategy. Something we've tried to be as a government is as transparent and forward-leaning as possible in terms of what policy and ideas we'll put out into the public domain in the international sphere. So if ever you're interested enough and um, tapping away on your online searches during the course of the day, please have a look at our website. Um, and just tap in International Cyber Policy Australia and you'll find all sorts of documents that we put out there um, which I think make us one of the most transparent countries um, in the world in terms of what we're willing to say in this important area of work. Um, and we've placed this position and the work that we do at the heart of multi-stakeholderism. So we ensure that the kinds of policies that we take are tried and tested with um, broader communities than just a government thought box. Um, we really try and ensure um, that we are reaching out to as broad a cross-section of society, civil society, private sector, um, and a number of entities I see in this room, including AP Nick, who, who we work with very closely to ensure that we are um, as connected as possible and pulling in as many different views in the way that we approach cyberspace. Um, and I think if there's one thing that I've seen over the three years of doing this job is the fact that whilst we thought that cyber-related issues were absolutely vital and, and growing in importance strategically in the international environment back in 2016-17 when this position was formed, now we are seeing cyber-related and technology-related issues at the absolute heart of geopolitics um, in a way that I, to be frank, couldn't have even myself imagined um, back in 2017 when I began in this job. And, and that's a huge burden of responsibility in the way that states are looking at this issue, but it also places, I think, um, a huge burden on all of us to try and think about creative solutions to what we see happening in the technology environment. So I'm, I'll be really thrilled to hear what kinds of issues you've spoken about during the course of today um, and some of the ideas and, and concepts or challenges for government um, that you think we should be listening to and understanding um, in this important area. And we're totally cognizant of uh, the opportunities that exist in cyberspace and the fact that really the online environment and the way it's developed has just been an enormous enabler of democratization, um, of freedom of speech, 
uh, and, and economic growth. And we think those are great things to celebrate. And recently, just uh, this year in Australia, we celebrated the 30th anniversary of the internet in our own country. Um, and we celebrated all those positive things that we think the internet brings to our society. But we are not averse to understanding that there is a dark side now that's growing. And, and the dark side that we look at is the increasing authoritarianism um, that's encroaching in our freedoms in the online environment. And I think once upon a time, the transparency that the internet provided was really um, a challenge to authoritarian regimes who saw it as a particular threat um, to their existence. And there's all sorts of interesting historical examples if you go back over the last 30 years where this is the case. But unfortunately, what's happened is that those authoritarian states have, have identified this as an issue and are now trying to exploit that openness, that transparency um, and democratization of information, education, and those further bonuses that we have in the online environment and use them back against us. And that deeply concerns the Australian government and the broader international community. And I think you've heard it in many of the keynote speeches yesterday, the concerns that are shared by um, all of us now in terms of what the online environment is morphing towards. Um, and we've seen that authoritarian states are willing to utilize um, the online environment uh, as a potent weapon to level the playing field against democracies. And we think that's something that's worth um, challenging. You know, the defining quality of, of a liberal democracy is the ability to uh, utilize the ballot box um, to ensure that you pass judgment on your leaders and change your government peacefully through that process. Um, but you know, we've observed numerous cases now where we see those democratic processes being interfered with in the online world. Um, equally, we see increasing instances of human rights abuses um, online. And we also see increasing cases of intellectual property theft. And we think these kinds of incidents aren't something we should all just blindly accept and not go without challenge. Um, and all of these are being increasingly enabled by cyberspace. Um, and they demonstrate that this openness that we're used to, um, to inherent to healthy democratic systems and free market economies are, are coming under uh, challenge and are being perceived as a key vulnerability. Um, but how do we increase that cooperation so that we can um, challenge uh, what's going on in, in the current um, in, environment? Well, we are in a period of, of transformational change in the digital space. Um, and new emerging technologies now are, are, are transcending borders in a way which is unprecedented in terms of its speed and, and reach and, and capability. Um, and we're increasingly reliant on these technologies. I mean, I, I often look at the technology space right now, and we have a whole range of di digital technologies which are maturing at a reasonably similar rate. Um, and the kind of combination effect of um, whether it be AI, whether it be quantum computing, um, and a whole range of other technologies, they're maturing rapidly, and it, it presents a challenge for government to understand how we keep up with that and ensure that we are acting as an enabling mechanism rather than a hindrance to these technologies um, enabling societies. Um, but it also challenges us in terms of how we operate with especially large private sector entities um, to try and keep up with those technological developments, the policy developments um, that are going on within the private sector itself. I mean, companies such as Google, Facebook, Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, they've all grown to an unprecedented size and scale in a very short space of time. Um, and that kind of rapid evolution of change, to be frank, we, as those inside government, we find that quite challenging because um, traditionally we're, I guess, perceived as fairly slow-moving beasts, um, especially when it comes to technology. So this, this presents us with challenges in terms of the way that we um, cooperate and engage with the private sector. And you're seeing this play out consistently in the international environment in the way that governments are um, addressing some of the issues with large multinational um, companies. And major tech firms are now foreign policy players in their own right. There's no getting away from that. The size, the reach, the influence that they have, um, they genuinely affect change um, in, in, in enormously significant ways, which I don't need to explain to a well-versed audience like yourselves, because you're all dealing with these issues and read about them constantly in the work that you do. Some companies are really willing to engage um, and have this conversation with governments and civil society. Some aren't. And to be honest, it's that disparity of approach which is incredibly challenging in, in how we take this forward. Um, an initiative that 
I myself began with the Danish tech ambassador. Um, we held in April in Silicon Valley something called a cyber and tech retreat. Well, why was it unique? Well, what we did was we brought together 20 of these kinds of positions from around the world um, and engaged with incredibly senior levels of some of the major tech players in Silicon Valley in order that we could just get a better, clearer understanding of the direction of travel, both in their own tech development cycles and their policy thinking, but also in terms of governments and how we're thinking um, about these issues. It's a small initiative, but one that we think can have more potency in the years to come to in, in order that we get on a similar kind of playing field when we're thinking about policy around technology. As governments, we need to become more flexible, adaptable, and proactive in the way that we deal with technology and the way we equip ourselves in a, being able to make policy. Um, and as I began my talk, I think I will kind of begin wrapping up around the idea of technology as a core aspect of geopolitics, which um, has already been a key theme of the IGF and, and gives genuinely the IGF, I think, um, increased fodder for engagement with that multi-stakeholder community. Because, you know, if we said in terms of the development of cyberspace and the associated technologies, that was predominantly in the hands of academia, uh, the private sector, and others, uh, this is certainly going to be the case in the whole range of technological developments that we're now addressing um, in the international environment. Um, we keep talking about issues like 5G. It's become almost like a, a global phenomena. Uh, we in Australia are incredibly used to talking about 5G. We made decisions around 5G very early on in the piece compared to many countries around the world. In fact, I think we were the first country to take uh, major decisions on, on 5G. But the importance of that decision is more setting a benchmark for a whole range of new technological developments that are coming on stream and the way that we as governments view these as a core part of our own infrastructure, of our own policy making cycles. Um, and so for us, it's not so much that we focus on 5G, but more what it presents as a precedent for thinking about technology issues. What is it that you want as a nation from uh, your technology posture? Um, what is it that you want to gain? What are the kind of values that you think are important for technological developments to imbue and um, uh, absorb uh, in the years to come? And I think that is a really important discussion to have in this room today about values and principles of technological development um, because your voice is incredibly important in, in what's coming down the track. So how governments around the world are going to take these challenges on and tackle these issues I think is going to shape our societies, our economies, our national security agendas um, over the next 20 years. Um, and it's one of the few areas, I think, in policy where you can really directly affect the way government is thinking. So you should challenge us, you should present us with questions and engage with us in what you think is important um, in this regard. Um, and ultimately, it's only by acting together as a community that we'll be able to shape the kinds of technology futures that we all want in this room. You know, we as government will have certain interests, but also as civil society, you will have other different interests. And it's only through balancing these um, and ensuring that we're all equipped with that understanding that we'll be able to kind of shape the technology environment of the future that we all want. And ensure that the security of all of us and our societies is at the heart of that. So thank you very much for letting me take up a bit of your time this morning. I'm really pleased to be here this morning, and, and I look forward to hearing all about uh, the discussions that you've had over the course of today. Thank you. Thank you, Fikin. Hello. Thank you, Fikin, for such a nice, you please, uh, such a nice uh, keynote about the very important subject. Yesterday only, the CEO of the Siemens has uh, told that by 2020, our data will be 44 zettabyte. Lot of data, lot of responsibilities, and lot of issues. I was able to jolt out around the policies which the government has to make, friendly policies, not a hardcore policies, the openness, IPR issues, privacy, transparency. But before that, we have to think the self-responsibility on this subject. Because we are taking the security in a very light manner that it may not harm us, but it will harm to everyone. So now, the, without the interactive session, no session is properly completed. So if you have any questions, so please introduce yourself and ask the question to our cyber ambassador, Mr. Fikin.
Just wanted to explain a little bit how the session is going to work. Sorry, my name is Silvia Cadena. I'm one of the co-organizers and a MAC member. So the idea is that Ambassador Fikin gave us uh, his uh, keynote address, and then we have a bit of time to ask him questions. I'm not sure if you have to leave or you can stay with us for the rest of the session. But if you, if you have to leave, it's fine. We have you for a few minutes for, for questions. And then after, we are going to break into uh, six uh, gr groups that are going to work through the sub themes on this track that is going to cover the conference for the rest of the, of the week. And we have among us the facilitators for those uh, sub themes. And they will have a, a few minutes to introduce themselves and um, what are the areas that are going to cover under those uh, sub themes. And then we will break out in discussions. If you look at your shared of, of your schedule app or SCED or shared, whatever you want to uh, pronounce it, there is a QR code on that screen. You can click on it or you know, use your phones or your mobile phones or your devices and get a spreadsheet that we are putting together with the pitches of your sessions, uh, if there are session organizers under the track. And we are collecting the messages from this track, the safety, security, stability, and resilience track that will cover the rest of the week and working on a, on a MAC report about what, uh, what discussed during the week. So that, that's, that's the, the, the lay, let's say, of, of the discussion. So I have the rowing mics. I will be around uh, giving the mics to people that are nice, brave, and great to open the discussion so we can warm up. So please raise your hands, and uh, I will walk around. Would you mind to pass the mic? Hello, thank you for your comments. Uh, Greg Shannon from uh, Carnegie Mellon. Um, could you speak to how uh, uh, you there uh, think about uh, sovereignty in cyberspace, in cybersecurity, in the decisions that uh, you, know, you as a government are trying to make uh, around uh, sovereignty issues? You know, we have interesting conversations going on around ICANN, you know, kind of a, a uh, um, non-governmental, non-state uh, actor that has a huge influence. Thanks very much. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the whole issue of cyber sovereignty is um, one, of, one of the core discussions that we get into, especially in the multilateral arena. Um, there are a whole range of countries that will state very strongly and robustly that cyber sovereignty is a thing that we, have, we should have the ability to, if you like, imprint borders in cyberspace. Um, I would say our position is somewhat different from that. Um, you know, we, at, at heart of Australian policy, you know, we, we don't think that cyberspace does have specific borders. Um, we believe in the principles of free flow of data, um, you know, the rights of the individual online, all, all, all these sorts of principles which um, we, we think are, are important for the kinds of cyberspace ecosystem that has allowed us to develop where we are. And we think the more that you begin imposing incredibly strict principles of sovereignty in cyberspace, the less innovative we'll be, um, the less able to ensure that this incredible technological function that enables our global communications and markets to flow, the more that we begin to lock it down and shut it down and impose those kinds of border restrictions, um, the less beneficial it's going to be for all of us. However, we are mindful of the fact, um, and it's important to say that, you know, we are dealing with an internet environment which is fundamentally different from what we knew in Australia 30 years ago when it was first introduced. I wish I had the figures to hand of how many users we had when the internet was first switched on, you know, so when they turn the engine on at the internet in Australia, I imagine we'd be talking tens of thousands of users. Now we're talking about, you know, 90% of our population plus being connected, so that's somewhere in the region of, you know, 22 million users. That means that there's a very different environment that we're dealing with. So we're cognizant of the fact that in certain areas of legal practice, um, we do need to be able to enforce legal jurisdiction. Um, so, you know, I don't think any of us should be arguing about the ability to convict cyber criminals, whatever their particular criminal act. Um, we, we want to be able to convict um, those individuals. So that means that we have to be thinking about the application of law in cyberspace. And we think that's an important process to go through. We don't think there should be um, an incredibly wide-ranging raft of new 
especially in the international arena, um, new legal practice that needs to be drafted. It's more about, well, how do we apply existing law um, in the online environment so it's respected? Um, and, and again, I think, I think that's the challenge we have as, uh, as, as governments wherever you sit in the world, is that you know, the way that we talk about the internet is often, I think, based on the assumptions of when it was built. And it's, you know, we're talking about so many billions of users now compared to where we were when we began 30 plus years ago. So, you know, we still want to embody all those principles and do of open, free, secure. We don't want there to be restrictive borders in cyberspace, which some countries most definitely do. Um, but we're also cognizant of there are certain aspects of legal practice that need to be um, easier to apply um, in the online environment as offline. And I think it's most clearly in the criminal space um, that we think that that's a really important discussion that's challenging us all. How do you maintain the kind of core ethos as far as possible of the way the internet was set up and run, but applying it in a modern context where it's, an, it's a very different beast in the way it's used? And it's, it was fascinating hearing, hearing Tim Berners-Lee yesterday talk about you know, that journey that he's seen uh, the internet and you know, his, his own personal technical journey of seeing what he invented change so fundamentally. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges we have in government. Um, and how do we as liberal democracies ensure that we do that in, in the right way? And, and I think you know, the whole area of, um, uh, of, of this engagement process with the tech industry is particularly challenging um, because um, and in Australia, you know, there are certain pieces of legislation that we've introduced um, which are applicable to the tech industry, but then you can get into all sorts of conversations about how, that, how you then actually apply that law in a jurisdiction outside of your own shores, and it becomes very difficult. So in many ways, it's about setting legislation which creates principles around which you want the tech industry to engage with you as a government. And again, I kind of restate it, it's making sure that those are based in liberal democratic principles and values. Um, and, and we ensure that that's the case um, in, in the Australian setting. But there is no doubting that the issue of cyber sovereignty, and I don't know how many of you are in, you know, kind of completely aware of what's going on at the UN, um, at the United Nations, we've been through a process of having these groups called UN Groups of Government Experts. I see a few nodding heads, that's reassuring, that's great, um, who have agreed in 2013 that international law applies in cyberspace, including the entirety of the UN Charter, and in 2015 agreed that there are 11 norms of behavior that applied in cyberspace. We've put those into our own policy documents. I think we're one of the few countries that's actually you know, entrenched it in our policy. Um, but certainly the issue of cyber sovereignty is a consistent theme of the conversation and challenge um, to the way that we think the international system should work. That's a really good question. Thank you. Um, my name is Amrita Chaudhary. I'm from India, CCI. Um, you know, while the geopolitics and cyber politics is completely changing because of technology, as you rightly mentioned, um, there have been reports of uh, governments such as yours asking tech companies for certain access to information, which is rightly so in certain cases, like for, but how do you draw the balance between how much access you should have uh, as a sovereign one should have and how much uh, would affect the um, you know, basic human rights or anyone's privacy? How do you strike the balance? Because there's also a question of um, having too much of access. No, absolutely, and, and a really good question. And I'm really pleased that I can sit in front of you and have that conversation with you because if, um, you know, there's many countries where you would not be able to have that conversation and you wouldn't be able to challenge policies that a government came out with. Um, in terms of the legislation that you're talking about, um, absolutely, like fundamental human rights principles are at the core of you know, when we make these kinds of legislative decisions. Um, and in terms of the access bill that you're referring to, um, it, it got a lot of misrepresentation in the press. And, you know, hand on heart, as a government, have we learnt lessons from how we communicate policy? 100%. Um, once you read into the detail of it, I think it, it would allay 99% of the kinds of fears that, that have been portrayed in the media. Um, so for us, well, what does that legislation mean? Well, it's saying to the tech industry, there are, in certain cases, with appropriate judicial oversight, there are certain cases where we would want to have the legal right to look at 
content. Um, and if you are trying to apply areas of your own criminal law in the online environment, we don't think that's incredibly unreasonable. Um, we are, as has been represented in the media, we are not looking for companies to build back doors into their technology. Because one thing, and again, it should be quite clear, and maybe we don't make this point clearly enough, if, for whatever reason, a country broke encryption, well, we'd be doing ourselves out of our own economy, out of our own ability to function, because as governments, we function on the backbone of, of good, robust encryption. So we're certainly not looking to do that. Um, and we understand that, you know, as citizens, everything we do is enabled via encrypted services. I wouldn't be able to enjoy all the wonderful things I do on my phone um, if I didn't have an encrypted serv or encrypted services to be able to do all of those things through. So that's where we start from. And it's just saying with proper legal oversight, legal jurisdiction, we, we want to be able to look at certain content in certain legal cases. And I think it's, it's targeted, it's about proportionality, um, and it's ensuring that yes, we don't, that those kinds of pieces of legislation are never misused. Um, and I think what we have seen as well from the tech industry is beginning to come up with some really innovative ways that they can actually deal with that legislation. And in some ways it's led to innovation, pieces of innovation in the tech space, um, which is superb it still allows you know, the customer bases to have every ounce of confidence in what they're doing and the level of encrypted services that they would expect and have a right to expect while still being able to um, be able to um, actually, in certain legal cases, allow access in a specific way. Um, you know, there are other countries where that's not the case. And, um, <laughs> you know, and I think that there is a very definitive difference in terms of what it is. But I think, as well, no one should think for a second that in a country like Australia, we don't take those kinds of decisions um, incredibly, uh, in a really considered manner and with true consideration of, you know, the impacts and consequences of these kinds of decisions. Because as I said, you know, at its heart, we want an internet um, and respective technologies which enable our societies um, and enhance people's security and confidence um, in what they're doing in the online space. Uh, Ambassador, I have a question. While I'm seconding the question of Amrita, I'm asking a very specific question. Very recently, one of the communication app has lost the confidence of the user. I'm naming that WhatsApp. Pegasus software, which has been used to breach the communication between the two uh, users, and uh, while they are claiming that we are highly encrypted end to end, and nobody can, whenever the government is asking them to share the data messages, they refuse, saying that we are end to end encrypted. But now the third party software is able to breach the communication. Then how the confidence, how the human right will be getting addressed? I'm afraid I'm not going to comment on a specific platform. I'm afraid which doesn't, you know, kind of directly involve Australian policy making. Um, but, you know, I, I I would return to the point that I think any application, um, wherever it is, and you know, I, I understand. I've read the cases that you talk about. They're in the media. Um, it's it's for that platform to decide. What, what do they feel their corporate social responsibility is in certain cases, right? So, I mean, I, I don't want to get into the kind of specifics of where you went in terms of how that could be utilized, because to be frank, once you get into a discussion like that, it's as far as the imagination can run, right? But I think what the questions we should be asking companies now is, yes, we want encryption, but isn't there, isn't there a part of corporate social responsibility for your platform to your users and, and to also kind of to, to the law um, when it's applied in, in the appropriate manner. Um, I, I don't think it's a good enough response to just say we have absolutely no responsibility for what goes on on our platform and therefore you know, we absolve ourselves of any responsibility of what's going on on this platform in terms of content wise. I think that's, that's a really hard stance to defend 
um, in, in certain cases that we see and we deal with regularly in terms of in, inside government. And I appreciate these are contentious issues, and I'm sure I can imagine quite a number of people in the room just cringing at what I'm saying. But, you know, we're not, unfortunately, we are not living entirely in the utopian world anymore in cyberspace. You know, we know that there's a whole, there are a whole range of kind of dark things that are going on in this environment. And our job is to ensure that we get better and better at making good policy decisions as a community which allow the internet to function in the way that it should, which is as an in just the most fundamentally game-changing enabler of modern time. And we need to be getting this right more quickly because of everything that's about to further connect us um, in the coming years, which need good sound policy decisions made about them now. Because if we make bad choices, well, then we, we could stifle what's going to be one of the most exciting periods, I think, of technological developments in, in certainly in my lifetime, if not beyond. Thank you. the last one. We have questions later. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for engaging in these discussions. Uh, my name is Kavar Ranjbar, I, I, and I understand your, uh, basically your narrative on how, how the Australian government make, make policies and how they are, apply, how they are applied. Uh, the main thing, and, and you mentioned, uh, I think it was the AA bill that you were trying to, to explain. Uh, you mentioned the uh, reliance on the judicial uh, system and uh, uh, basically, it's it's all governed by that, which is fair. But I think the whole balance of uh, power and checks and balances in how these things work are based on uh, basically how applicable all are the laws. So when when these systems were put in place, the, the open and liberal government of uh, uh, or a state of Australia, uh, basically it was hard to go to uh, at once to go to one million homes and knock their doors and see okay I, I need to see inside of your home so there are checks and balances and say okay you can propose legislation and there's judicial uh, uh, governance there and there's oversight but now uh, some some of these legislations basically enable uh, the government to with judicial approval to look into let's say communication of one thousand or five thousand or a million uh, citizens at once and nobody is looking into that balance of power and uh, has the checks and balances are in place or not. And I see government as one part of the state is doing their job, but who is looking at the bigger picture? Can I interrupt though, because this is a real misperception of government, and you're talking someone who's come from outside of government in. So I've been that guy in think tanks who's looked at national security policy, cyber policy, and tech policy for the last 20 years of my life. And I've had the, um, the you know, the in terms of the research environment I've been in, it's often been with various government agencies looking at what they do and why and how it's done. And so, and now it's really interesting being inside of government and trying to ensure that, that we make good policy decisions which are mindful of kind of broader interests of civil society, the private sector. And maybe that's one of the biggest benefits that I can bring into government is that, you know, the broader thinking that I've grown up with in my professional environment. But it's, it, it's, and again, maybe, maybe you know, and I'm, I'm trying to be, you know, useful in my answers in the sense that we need to be better at communicating this. But actually, as a liberal democratic government, we do go through those processes. And it's not that, you know, a decision inside government to have access, you know, it is, is just made like that. Yes, you know, as the Australian government, we want to look at everyone's data in Australia. That's just not the case. Don't have the capability. Don't want to do it. Have no principled requirement to or do we want to, right? And I think unfortunately where we get to is in this this very bipolar discussion of almost like government bad. It does everything to try and, you know, undermine the citizen or you know and, and it becomes one of two things and it's just oversimplification of what's going on. Because actually, you know, there are various review processes going on, um, independent review processes of our legislation in Australia. And if you think how fresh and you know new these kinds of legislative powers are, we're already reviewing, we're already looking at them, we're looking how we can tighten them, how we can tweak them to ensure that we're mindful of human rights of people and business concerns around these pieces of legislation. So 
You know, I, th I, I think actually that's a really healthy way of making these kinds of policy decisions. And so for, sorry for jumping in, because it's, it's, it's trying to redress that. And that's one of my jobs as, a, you know, as, as working in government and representing the Australian government to make sure that we get better at communicating that, to, in, to reassure the public that they're not, they're not being led on a merry dance by the Australian government here, not at all. <laughs> You know, there's Thank all you. sorts of checks, balances, measures, reviews, um, you know, legal process that have to be followed. Thank you. I think you answered my question. My question was uh, was not, uh, I wasn't criticizing the, the government. I was just asking, as a representative of government, are you satisfied, basically, with uh, not only the government role in that, but the whole, basically, the three aspects, that the, the parliament, the judicial, and, uh, and the government, basically uh, having enough checks and balances for this? Because not Australian, but in general, any government can actually now, with uh, looking at the, the, when these systems were set up, to, and have checks and balances for the whole for the whole state, correct? Yeah. Uh, they, there are loopholes there. And I just wanted to know, as an Australian government representative, do you feel confident that the, that the current system for, this, for the whole state, uh, the checks and balances are enough? And or are there systems in place to basically correct them, like the, the review panels you mentioned and things like that? So I'm comfortable as an Australian citizen and actually seeing inside the system, yeah, exactly what the kinds of checks and balances are. And I, you know, happily reassure the, any member of the public about that. And the wonderful thing, I think, is that we're still willing to say, well, let's look at that again. Let's look how we can create more accountability, more reassurance, um, and checks and balances. And again, I think that's, that's a better policy cycle than being in a position that we see in many other countries where you, A, can't even broach these issues. You wouldn't have a government official like me sitting in front of here and actually discussing these kinds of issues with you, and there'd be no right to reply. Wholesale human rights abuses conducted with you know, no sort of discussion in a room like this. That, to me, is a big problem. Um, so what I think we need to be better at as uh, a government like Australia or anyone you know, would take this better at communicating what those checks and balances are. But let's be frank, it doesn't make like the kind of news headlines that a newspaper or, or you know, an online news outlet really wants to convey. Thank it's, you. it's not as sexy, is it, as you know, <laughs> those other kinds of issues. Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, this session, and especially to the ambassador for enlightening a lot of issues and answering lot of questions. Thank you very much. And uh, now I will request for the group out session and uh, all the organizers of that group may join on the desk. Mm -hmm. Yes. So for the moderators of the, the facilitators, sorry, of the breakout discussions, if you guys can come to the stage for a minute so we can introduce yourselves and the topics and then we will break into small groups or we see how it goes, because I'm not sure how people in the room will feel about this, but we'll see how it goes. Thank you so much. There are, yeah, okay. Thank you so much, Ambassador. So I'm Rita, Kai, uh, there Alexander, There are six Peter, groups, Charlotte, safety, security, stability, technology, ethics, and Yeah, yeah. If they can speak for two minutes each, yeah. Okay, then. <laughs> what I will suggest is that all these group leaders should speak for one, one, and one and a half minutes, and then they can create the group, and accordingly, then we can start the discussion. Uh, now I will re request Anna Laura Martins. Martinez. Yeah, for the safety. Okay, uh, well, uh, my name is Ana Laura Martinez. Uh, I am Uruguayan, but I come from Brazil now, where I work uh, uh, with the Internet Steering Committee of Brazil, actually in a research center focused on indicators of internet access and usage. We specialize in measuring that, and we also cooperate with other countries of the world on how to measure that. One of our focuses is internet ethics and, uh, and child safety. We, we run a 
uh, nationally representative uh, survey on that, specialized on that issue, uh, linked to the Global Kids Online Network. This is one of the research lines that we work for. And we work closely, closely with um, a set of uh, um, governmental and non-governmental actors working on this issue of child, online, online child safety. Uh, this is the workshop that we presented for next Thursday. So I'm very happy to be here, um, and I will facilitate the South theme on safety, the breakout discussion on safety. Thank you. Now for the security, the Alexander. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Alexander Savnian. Uh, I'm from Russian Internet Protection Society. Uh, in uh, our company, I'm making researches uh, on how uh, Russian legislation and, uh, and laws m affects Russian internet development. Also, our organization uh, advocacy makes advocacy for free internet. As we know, in Russia, it's not as free as we want. And here, uh, I will discuss security topic. It's a really difficult thing because in policy world and in technical worlds, understanding what security is is completely different. So we'll try to connect uh, and collect opinions on what will go on on IGF. Thank you, Alexander. For the stability and resilience, Kavi. Hello, uh, my name is Kavi Reinspar. Uh, I'm originally from Iran, uh, living in the Netherlands for the past 12 years. Uh, I'm uh, in my day job. I'm a CIO CTO at Ripe NCC, which is the regional, uh, basically, uh, internet registry for Europe, Middle East, and Central Asia. I'm also uh, a non-voting member of ICANN board uh, and in charge of operating KROOT, one of the 13 root servers. For the uh, basically a stability and resilience track, I think there, there are multiple challenges we have to deal with, but uh, there are a few questions which I think are now prominent in discussions, uh, not only in IGF, but in, uh, in multiple forums. One of them is uh, how is, can, can we approach this or should we approach this, uh, the stability and resilience as a global issue or should be, should be this regional? And then regional can be defined either in regions or countries. Uh, and there are, there are multiple examples which I think in the breakout session we will get into. Also, resilience has a very strong technical factor. For example, the unique identifiers, uh, IPv4 uh, is basically has run out in most of the world. And, and it will run out soon in, the, in all of the world. So that's, that's one of the, the questions that's uh, facing the whole uh, industry. And, uh, and it also has non-technical uh, factors, including financial aspects and, and uh, the organizations which are running them, uh, their governance, their financial health, and all of that. And I think there's, there's a lot of questions to, to be explored in that track, so. Thank you. Yesterday only the RIPE has allocated the last yes. IPv4 pool. Yes, which uh, ended uh, the, the, uh, so you are the v4 first. For, for Europe, uh, Middle East, and Central Asia. There is no more. IPv4 you are the first into the RIAs. Uh, for allocating last IPv4 yes, tool. So, so uh, APNIC has already run out and, uh, and Arius, so yes. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, for the technology, I will request Mr. Peter. Yes, thank you. My name is Peter Koch. As, uh, my day job is working as a senior policy advisor for DINIC, which is the uh, country code top level domain for Germany. And I'm also the chairman of the board of the German ISOC chapter. Um, I have a strong technical background, um, been active in uh, the number space, like in RIPE, in the IETF, and uh, more recently also in ICANN. As the top-level domain registry, we are, of course, concerned uh, with a lot of things, um, the uniqueness of the uh, identifier system, uh, keeping the identifier system out of discussions about content control, and uh, on a broader scale, the issues that I think we can address in some of the workshops and in the breakout sessions. This is uh, concentration and consolidation and uh, potential consequences for uh, the regulatory aspects of, of certain things. And of course, uh, the, the overall um, stability of the, uh, of the internet uh, identifier system. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Uh, for the internet ethics, Amrita from India. Hi, good morning. Um, so I am based out of India. I run a, a civil society organization called CCAOI. We work uh, primarily on internet policy issues, speci specifically looking at end users. Um, and a 
bit more of capacity building uh, in terms of engaging more communities into discussions, uh, discussing issues how technology is affecting users. Um, and so internet ethics, which Sylvia had got in touch with me for the breakout session is something of interest because with uh, internet actually coming into our lives, um, we also need to see that, you know, we have issues of misinformation, fake news, etc. And it's a global phenomena. Um, and we need to see who is responsible because it cannot just be the government. It cannot just be the technology companies. But there has to be, um, and the policies which are being framed may not be applicable at all times. Um, sometimes there are concerns of stifling human rights, whereas these issues need to be addressed. Similarly, um, there are questions as in, if you look at the various proposed workshops uh, in this, uh, in the internet ethics, which are uh, in um, IGF this time also for such uh, workshops, there are discussions on whether um, the ethics uh, aspect has to be looked at all the uh, la layers, uh, or is it just in the content layer? Then there are discussions on uh, the role of governments. Uh, are there any best practices available which others could actually look at? Uh, does self-regulation help? So these are certain things which I'm also interested to understand because uh, uh, from my organization we are doing a study on trying to understand whether at the India perspective whether digital literacy or awareness has um, helps uh, our Digital illiteracy is makes people more vulnerable to misinformation, especially in India. We had last year around 21 cases of lynching, uh, death by lynching, which um, and the messages were shared through uh, a, a messaging platform. Uh, not necessarily the messaging platform is to be blamed, but the information went viral very soon. And so these are certain things which we need to find, at least not a solution, but some. Uh, ways to address. Thank you, Amrita. And a very important subject which is widely being discussed is the human right. And I will request Christopher. Char sorry, Charlotte. Yes, thank you. Good morning. My name is Charlotte Altenhöhner. I'm here with the Council of Europe, the uh, European's leading human rights organization where I had a small internet governance unit. The Council of Europe has for decades been setting standards and helping its 47 member states to hardwire human rights safeguards into the decisions they take and they implement with respect to the online space. What does this really mean? It means for the Council of Europe that we bring in the rule of law into what we do when, it, when we work uh, with regard to the online space. All interferences with human rights, whether this means freedom of expression, privacy, or other rights, must be based on law, open law, accessible laws that are approved through democratically, democratic processes. They must be legitimate and they must be proportionate. Um, this must be um, put in place with effective remedies, of course, as well, and then um, we have oversight through courts. This was already discussed today. What that means in the individual case is, of course, often uh, quite problematic. We have four work uh, sessions under this uh, working group uh, with the sub-theme Human Rights. At the IGF this year, two relate to illegal content online, one specifically on hate speech and one a little bit broader on uh, illegal content, including hate speech. We have one session that relates to misinformation and um, uh, suitable governance mechanisms for that, and then one that looks at the shadow market of medical products online and how more safety standards for consumers can be incorporated there. So I look forward to the discussion, and um, good luck at, at the IGF. Mm, thank you. Charlie. Now, for the half an hour for the breakout. Yes, I, I was just going to ask. I was just going to ask um, to check with the room who are, of you are session organizers. Okay, only three. So the idea was to break into groups um, to showcase your sessions and discuss the sub themes of the, the safety, security, resilience, and stability track. 
and there is a section at the end for the showcase of the sessions. Knowing that there are only three organizers here, I think it's safe to say that we have more time for the breakout discussions. So now it depends on how you, we, this room, can, we can move around and have uh, each one of the facilitators sitting in different tables and then you can uh, walk around. And the, the um, Google document that is on the QR code that I mentioned earlier, if someone from the group can please help us to take some notes because the, there is no transcript and no remote uh, participation for the breakout groups, that would be really appreciated. So I think we can break, I don't know how you want to do it, in two tables, two tables and two tables or something like that, if that will work. And then we will come back. Uh, Half an hour. Uh, to give the order? OK. Um, Safety, <laughs> so Maria Laura here in these two tables. Uh, human rights here with Charlotte, in these two tables. Then Cabe with uh, the stability here. Uh, Amrita here with uh, um, internet ethics. Uh, Alexander here with security. And then industry technology and trade here with Pita.